Good evening, everyone. TSB Television welcomes you back to Einar Anderson Stadium for WFA football. Today's match rekindles a rivalry that flared up last year with the Iowa Explosion and the Minnesota Machine. Stick around. This exciting rivalry will resume shortly. Hello, everyone. Mike Peden once again welcoming you. My partner, Jeff Williams, will join me momentarily. Minnesota coming into this game at 4-2, the same record as Iowa. But the big difference is the divisional alignment this year. The WFA expanded greatly last year, and so the two teams are no longer in the same division. But that doesn't mean the rivalry hasn't died down. Iowa has won three straight games against Minnesota, which includes a 7-0 shutout this season and the playoff victory last year in a game that was called due to severe weather. Iowa's out of the playoff picture, but they could play spoilers to Minnesota, who are currently locked in a fight with the Wisconsin Wolves to take home the upper Midwest Division title and a playoff date with the Kansas City Tribe. Here's the playoff breakdown for you. If the Machine win today, they control their own destiny. If they lose and Wisconsin wins, both teams are tied, and that would make next week's game against the Wisconsin Wolves a winner-take-all scenario. If both teams win or lose today, Minnesota would have the edge, but because Wisconsin would have to win and beat Minnesota by 22 points or more to claim the division title by virtue of a tiebreaker. So a lot of things can happen, a lot of situations, and a lot of changes for both these rosters. Iowa not as strong in depth as they were a year ago, but they still have Jennifer Bowling, who has won the table against the Minnesota Machine in the last few games. And the Machine have also had to pull a few audibles themselves. They no longer have Nicole Feets at quarterback, who they lost to an ACL injury last week. And they also have added Hannah Cheese, who you might recall, if you're a high school basketball fan, she used to play for the Minneapolis South Tigers. She added a lot more depth to their running game, an area where they were looking to find a strong running back after losing Sarah Wolf to an ACL injury in week two. A lot can happen. We don't know what will happen, but we're going to find out when we come back for the kickoff. And welcome back to Einar Anderson Stadium. I have now moved up to the press box with my compadre, Jeff Williams. And Jeff, uh, once again, will explain the playoff scenario quickly. Minnesota, if they win today, they control their destiny. If they lose, that's when things could really shake up. Mike, I heard this last year. Last <laughs> year at this time, it was actually these same two teams. They were then called the Iowa Thunder. Now they're called the Iowa Explosion. And it was playoff implications at this time last year. It was a different field, but then ended up where these two teams ended up matching up right here in Minnetonka in the playoffs. Which Iowa won as that game was called to severe weather. But I spoke with Iowa at, before that game, and they were bittersweet about that match because they wanted to win and play all 60 minutes. They didn't want to go home early. And they ended up going home early because of lightning and the machine. I think they still feel ripped off on that and the way it was handled between the two coaching staffs. But that was last year. Last year's last year. This year with uh, Daniel Townsend lining up for the kickoff. It's a new season. It's a new year and it's a new opportunity. Iowa still wearing the same jerseys as last year, just a different name. And Minnesota, of course, wearing their home orange as Thompson with a short kick. That goes out of bounds, so a flag, but Iowa will start at the 40, so essentially Minnesota doesn't lose anything. Right now they haven't lost anything, and it's going to be an interesting matchup. We're going to see, we're going to see a really competitive ball game tonight. So let's take a look at the Iowa starting offense. The quarterback is Courtney Axley, and the running backs are Jennifer Bowling and Lulu Kiotai. The wide receivers are Christine Dorenkamp and Ashley Dickinson. The tight end is Chantella Steffi. Your offensive line is Carrie Gray, Jean Elam, Marcy Wilson, Michelle Chapman, and Christy Sorg, and Jennifer Bowling. If that name sounds familiar, she lit up Minnesota in the regular season broadcast we televised last year. Jennifer Bowling was the heart of the Iowa team last year, and I think she's the heart of the Iowa team this year. Now, Mike, I understand there's been some realignment that went on in the offseason. We'll get to that in a moment, but we have first and 10 as Bowling in the backfield. Keep an eye on her, and she gets the first carry of the game, looking for space, and she will have a first down run to start the game for Iowa as she is taken out of bounds at the Minnesota 41, 19-yard gain. Talking about what you said, Iowa went through some ownership changes. Uh, their previous owner, from what I heard, had some shady dealings about him, so the Iowa team took it upon themselves and decided to 
rebrand themselves as the Explosion and put the Thunder name to rest. Now, what conference or what division is the Iowa Thunder in right now? They are oh, in the, the, Midwest, the Midwest Division, while Minnesota got relocated to the Upper Midwest Division as the league expanded greatly. Between last year and this year, another first down for Iowa. Actually looking to throw this time. She had a wide open explosion. Christine Doran camp, but it's incomplete. Minnesota starting defense, they run a 4-3. It's going to be Nell Gelhouse, defensive end Lisa Olson at tackle, Nina Cochiarella also at tackle, and Jessica Patnode who had a big game against Nebraska as the other defensive end. Your cornerbacks are Don Schmidt and Katrina Stewart. And you also have Lacey Roberts and Mary Walruff and Abigail Smith completing the linebackers in the secondary. Carmen Richardson and Sarah Bishop are the linebackers, I should point out. Second and 10, and we have movement. Moving on, movement on the line. We'll see who it's on. It looks like it will be against Iowa, but we'll check the marker. No, it's encroachment. That will make it second and five. Gellhouse jumped the line. Now to explain Iowa's situation, they are playing simply for the spoiler role. The Kansas City Tribe have ended their regular season and have locked up the Midwest Division by beating this Iowa team twice in convincing fashion in 82-0 and 77-0 shutout. In their two divisional games, Carmen Richardson ramps up the Iowa runner, and it looks like it was bowling again. It's hard to tell, as since Iowa kept the same jerseys as last year, they have the yellow on white color scheme, and even for a 2020 guy, it's tough to see. Well, last year I complained about our eyesight. You're the young guy, I'm the old guy, and the old guy's eyes have just gotten worse, so... <laughs> Third and six. As Axeline lines up under the shotgun, looking to throw. Has Dorncamp open again, but too strong. Fourth and six coming up, and it looks like Iowa will go for it. I don't see the punter going out there. Well, with the penalty, that reset. Oh, I guess it is fourth down. They were they were wrong on the clock. Okay. We're caught up now. We are with 13.29 left in quarter number one. And they will go forward on fourth down with four receivers and Axling under center. And she is almost wrapped up and Patno finishes her off. So Jessica Patno, who had a big game against Nebraska, and certainly the defensive player of the game makes a huge defensive stop here. And you have to give a lot of credit there to Willie Howard. He's the head coach and the defensive coordinator for this machine squad and the former Minnesota Vikings. So the guy knows how to coach. He knows defense. And it, that play right there had just, that was classic Willie Howard. He's got this team, this defense ready. So we'll get our first look at the Minnesota offense. I don't have a statistical analysis for you because they have not posted stats from their last two games. Iowa hasn't from their last four games, but we do the best we can with what we have as Merriman hands off to Searcy, and Searcy with the hole, she gets to the 46-yard line in Iowa territory, one yard shy of a first down. Your Minnesota offense, as we mentioned, the quarterback is Mandy Merriman, in for Nicole Feetz, who suffered an ACL injury. Yolanda Searcy and Maggie Alt are your running backs. Your wide receivers are Daniel Thompson, Becky Bauman, and number 15, Katie Flynn. Your offensive line, Heather Baker, number 91, Leela Willard, 76, Angela Allman, the center, 71, Susan Brooks, number 74, at right guard, and Brett Campos, the right tackle, Jesse Boyles, the tight end. And a quarterback keeper by Merriman should be enough for the first down, and it is. Quickly, the Iowa defense, the defensive line, they run a 5-3. It's Chantella Steffi and number 28, Mook Bascom making up the defensive ends. Aaron Wilson, the nose tackle, Juanita Richardson and Mary Lou Warner, your defensive tackles, Megan Egley, Cindy Taft, and Lulu Kiyotai as your linebackers. Olivia Zola, Jennifer Bowling, and Ashley Dickinson are your secondary for the explosion. 
fresh set of downs for the machine. Merriman to Cersei again. And this is the 40. And the Iowa coaching staff, Isaiah Schnurman, head coach and offensive coordinator, Ron Crowdis, assistant head coach and defensive coordinator, with Michael Young, assistant offensive coordinator and the quarterback coach, Jennifer Hirakawa, assistant defensive coordinator, Mike Rand, offensive line coach, Danny Davis, linebackers and defensive backs coach, and Robbie Morris Riley is the special teams coach. So they've even had a coaching shuffle in uh, Iowa over this last offseason. Second and seven. Another handoff to Cersei. And she gets to the 33-yard line, roughly. And while we set our next play, Jeff will run off the Minnesota coaching staff. For Minnesota, you got the co-head coach and defensive coordinator, Willie Howard. Co-head coach and offensive coordinator, coordinator Michael Vinson. Offensive line coach, Doug Johnson. Receiver coach, Dante Williams, no relation. Offensive assistant, Terrell Preston. Kim Miller is the quarterback's coach. Assistant defensive coordinator is Robert Parker. Defensive line coach, Darren Olson. Defensive line coach, Derek Sims. Linebacker coach, Maurice Jones. Defensive backs coach, Rich Gray. And the defensive assistant is Ikovos Sokalos. First and 10 for Minnesota. Another handoff, it's to Hannah Cheese, and she's found some space as she moves her way to the 21-yard line before she's pushed back. And forward progress will spot her at the 22, so she gets things going with an 11-yard run. We don't have stats on her, but I was told during pregame that she added a lot in their victory over the Dragons last week, a 46-0 shutout on the road. Hannah Cheese. As I mentioned, if you recall her name, you'd have to follow high school basketball to do so. She played on the Minneapolis South team that finished runner-up to St. Paul Central in the 2007 Class 4A state championship. First and 10 on the Iowa 22-yard line. Minnesota looking to get in the red zone. They have yet to score on Iowa this season. I'm sure they'd love to reverse that trend. Jeez again. And Jeez maybe gets a couple yards. Looks like a two-yard gain. They spot her at the 19-yard line, a three-yard gain. Once you get to these ends of the field, of course, it's tougher to tell gains and losses with the harsh angle, and we're fighting against the sun as well. It's going to be interesting to see how these teams end up at the end of at halftime. I mean, the third quarter is when the sun starts setting, the lights come on at uh, Einar Anderson Stadium and you can usually feel the intensity pick up around the fourth quarter. Second and seven. 9.15 and counting. And it looks like a broken play as Merriman is wrapped up. Gains maybe a yard. It will be third down. Third down and seven. It looks like no gain. It appears that way. And they spot her at the 17, so maybe a two-yard gain on that play. That will make it third and about five. Cheese once again. They hand it off to her. Cheese finds another hole. I'll, tell, I'll say this for playing just two games all season. Cheese joined mid-season. She's doing a great job and showing great discipline. That's an eight-yard gain, or a six-yard gain, good enough for first down. Now it's first and goal for Minnesota. And that's what Minnesota has to do. They have to just continue to put their game plan together, find the holes, hit the holes, and they're going to get some results. First and goal. Again, Minnesota did not score on the road against Iowa. They would love to change that here. They have lost their last three games against the Iowa Thunder and Explosion, and Yolanda Searcy looking to turn the corner. Very close, but just outside the goal line. Pushed out at the one-half guard line. Wait a second, I thought that was my deal. I thought we didn't have halves. Still good enough for an eight-yard gain, though, and Minnesota just great job running the ball. Well, they say that football is a game of inches. The Minnesota machine need 18 of them in order to get their touchdown. 
Cersei staying under center. Second goal from the one. A lot of options here. It's going to be a quarterback keeper. Merriman trying to push past the goal line, and she is pushed out. Now, if Minnesota can convert here on third down, they do have a field goal kicker in Danielle Thompson, whose range is, her long, I should say, is 37 yards. So this would be a 21-yard field goal. I was watching the team during the pregame, and they kept inching Thompson back every five yards, and she was around the 34-yard line, and she came close to nailing one there, which would have been a 44-yard field goal if it was a game situation. But Minnesota hopes it won't come to that. This time they line up Cersei and Alt in the backfield. Alt scored the game's only touchdown, and we might have a false start. And we, we do. do. You know, every time we've done a game, we seem to jinx the team in terms of penalties. You know, they committed eight penalties in our last broadcast. They still won against Nebraska, though, because most of their penalties came in the first half and weren't as critical as the Stampedes were. But the Stampede also had a lot of the penalties in the second half, which also offset any of the penalties that happened with Minnesota in the first half. So that pushes them back five more yards, takes out a couple of options maybe. They try to Cersei again, Cersei with daylight, but it's wrapped up quickly. Doesn't touchdown. matter, touchdown. With the coverage, I can't quite read the number, again that color combination, but Yolanda Cersei, oh, was bowling. Bowling had a good angle and Cersei said, forget it, I'm going in. Cersei was determined. She knew what she had to do. She saw the goal line and was not going to stop for anybody or anything. And Cersei had struggled quite a bit in the first couple games of the year and getting some momentum going. So getting that touchdown, I think, for her confidence is big. And an early first down touchdown is crucial to this Minnesota team if they want to if they want a shot at the playoffs. They know they've got the implications on the line. And with 547 remaining in the first quarter, with the extra point, it is now seven to nothing, Minnesota machine over the Iowa explosion. Oh, no shutout this time for Minnesota, as it was a running back committee in a way with Hannah Cheese and Yolanda Searcy sharing the carries. So with 547 left, we'd like to remind you if you want to order a DVD copy of this game, you can go online at the sportsframe1.blogspot.com and pick up your copy. And we'll of course have a Minnesota machine highlight reel at the end of the season. Our last regular season broadcast will take place next Saturday when the Wisconsin Wolves come in. And depending on how they do today, that game could have huge implications. Or for Minnesota, it could be a chance to test out some new setups before they go into the playoffs. But again, Minnesota would have to win and Wisconsin Wolves would have to lose in order for Minnesota to clinch the division title outright today. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. If they win today, they're in the playoffs. If they win, they control their destiny, but they're not necessarily in. As we have a kickoff here, and it's fielded cleanly by Iowa, running to the 40, it's number seven. And that player is Olivia Zola. She gets to the 45, and so Iowa will try to respond to the touchdown. So if the machine win today, then the Wisconsin Wolves have to win next week by how much? If Minnesota and Wisconsin both win today, Wisconsin would have to beat Minnesota and do it by 22 points or more. If both teams lose or win, that's what the setup you'd have. And we'll explain that again in a bit because it's uh, pretty complicated as there are three possible scenarios. Bowling with the carry. She finds space on the right side. Oh, she is great at finding holes in the defensive line. Again, Jennifer Bowling is the heart and soul of this Iowa Explosion team. Gets a six yard game. Now if Minnesota wins and Wisconsin loses, then Minnesota wins the division title outright. Long story short, if Minnesota can come out here with the win today, they control their destiny. And then if they win next week, or win this week and lose next week, they have to hold the margin of error within 22 points. Correct. And actually, and it's picked off. The interception. With the pick is Mary Walrath. And that's an error on Iowa. Of course, actually, may still have a rotten taste in her mouth as she threw a pick six last year to Sarah Bishop. And one of the most exciting celebrations we had seen in the 2010 Minnesota Machine season. 
Well, Minnesota forces a turnover with 4.14 left, and they will take over at midfield. Now, going back to last year's playoff game, a lot of rain, a lot of thunder, a lot of lightning. Today, 70 degrees, sunny skies, perfect football weather, at least for the fans. I could use a few more clouds myself, but that's just me. Yolanda Searcy wrapped up from behind and tackled. She gets maybe one. For a moment there, it looked like that would have been a horse collar. Chantella Steffi with the tackle for the explosion. Yeah, it looked like Cindy Taft had grabbed her from the pads right behind the shoulder blades, which, at least in the NFL, would have been ruled a horse collar tackle. But no penalty. Makes it set a second down, eight yards to go. Ball's on the 48-yard line. And we have more movements, and Iowa and Minnesota couldn't quite get themselves set, and it will be charged to Minnesota their third penalty of the game. They've all been the five-yard variety, but again, I don't think Willie Howard likes this kind of start in terms of discipline. But this go ahead. This team usually gets four penalties per game on average. And they have three. They've got three now. They had eight in our last broadcast. So I'm going to put that blame on you, Mike, for putting out the jinx. At this pace, they would get 12. Cersei with the carry. And she rushes back to midfield roughly. And it will be a long third down for the machine. Third and about 11. And they're going to spot it on the 49 and a half. Now, one reason for the penalties, again, Minnesota, still a rather young team. They have bolstered their roster at the start of this season, but even then, they've gone through a few shifts and, of course, injuries, and that seems to be the mantra for Minnesota, battling through injuries and coming out on top. They did so last year, winning the, the division by holding Iowa within, I believe it was 15 points, and then closing out against Nebraska. It's third and 11, and our first pass of the day for Merriman, it's complete to Bauman, but she's going to be short of the first down as she's wrapped up by two explosion defenders, Zola and number 13, Lulu Kiotai. Fourth and two unofficially. Now last year, this coach, the, this, the, this Minnesota machine team was coached by Dan Lickness in the regular season. He coached them the entire year before, but uh, owner Lisa also didn't think he was going far enough, thought this team had a whole lot more potential and made a switch just before the playoffs. And it's worked out beautifully as Hannah Cheese takes the carry and gets more than enough for the first down. Minnesota will continue their possession at the 35. So after the regular season last year, Lickness gone. In comes Willie Howard. He was the interim coach during the one playoff game. He did not have enough time to work with the squad at that point in time. And Lisa Olson had removed the interim tag during the off season and made him the permanent head coach. And now it's been Willie Ball ever since. Speaking of Lisa, she is still hoping to get that BJ Raji style pick six as you recall when the Packers beat Chicago in the NFC Championship game. Cheese with a pitch on the left side and she is wrapped up in the open field. Good open field tackle by the explosion. And once again, I can't read the number from here. It looks like it was Steffi. Aaron Wilson for Iowa had a really good opportunity for a hit, a uh, full body tackle, and the machine player just ran right over her. First kid to bring a Band-Aid with a cartoon or movie character on it. Just over a minute to play in quarter number one. Minnesota in control from the start. Iowa with a turnover on downs and an interception. Minnesota with a touchdown. With three wides. Three on the left, one on the right. And instead, they go to Cheese in the running game. And Cheese gets maybe three, four yards as they will move to the 31. So second and about six. With a carry. As we have 30 seconds to go third in the first quarter. Six. It's third down and six. Oh, I was right. Third and six. Mark that down. That might be the only time of the game. You've been right a few times. 
Well, it's a good thing they don't have updated stats, or I might have jinxed them too in that regard. <laughs> and it looks like they're going to let the clock expire. We're down to less than 10 seconds. Now they're coming right out of the huddle. We got five, four, three, two, one. That is the end of the first quarter with the Minnesota Machine with a seven to nothing lead over the Ex Iowa Explosion here at Einar Anderson Stadium in Minnetonka, Minnesota. And to explain that joke, there's a running gig among myself and the Lynx Repress Corps in regards to free throw percentages, but the Lynx had a 30 point lead against Seattle going into the second half earlier this week and Seattle trimmed it to about seven, but the outcome was never really in doubt. But still, I got the blame and got some flack after I posted how they blew a 30-point lead last year to Connecticut, which they did win in overtime. But as you and I both know, games are not decided at halftime, no matter how badly the fans want to decide them. In the words of Candace Wiggins, a guard for the Minnesota Lynx WNBA squad, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And I'll tell you, translating that to women's football, that's exactly the philosophy that Willie Howard has. I also think that that's probably the same philosophy of Isaiah Schnurman, the head coach for Iowa. And going off that, you know, Minnesota only scored six points in the game against Nebraska. Maggie Elt scoring the game's only touchdown, but the defense held serve throughout. And a great finish to that game. And Minnesota now starting to click on offense, uh, posting 46 points against the Dragons while not allowing a point. The previous match, which was here, Minnesota won, but it was a lot closer. So the machine team, young, but they're getting better as the season goes on. And it's third and six from the 31-yard line for the Minnesota machine as we begin the second quarter. Team switch sides, of course. Another pass play. Merriman, that's going to be short. And she was hit as she threw. Good coverage by the Iowa defensive line. And with the coverage uh, was Aaron Wilson, 99, like you said, was ready to make a big hit earlier. Now she's disrupting the Minnesota offense, but they'll go for it here on fourth down at the 31. They have to get the ball past the 27-yard line, roughly, to convert. They have three wideouts on the right. One on the left, and they go to Searcy inside for a first down and more. They spot her at the 26, 21. Yes, the 22, 21. Actually, it looks closer to be the 22 yard line, but good enough for a first down. And That's another machine first down. the officials were generous to Iowa on that particular uh, spot. Uh, when you actually look at where the ball landed when on the tackle, it was closer to the 21, but they moved it back to the 22, and so that's where we're sitting at. But irregardless, that's what, they, what the machine needs to get into the end zone. And Cersei with the carry again, but this time she's wrapped up. No way. Really. But I'm intrigued by their play calling where they have a pass play set up, they send all the wideouts, and then they give the ball to Cersei or Cheese in the middle, and let the holes develop. It's going to be fascinating to watch the shift on the Iowa defense. And we should know both teams have identical records. Iowa defeating all their opponents outside of the Kansas City Tribe. Minnesota at 4-2. and two. Their two losses, of course, were to this team and the Chicago Force to open the season. Second and 10. This time, it's Cheese. Cheese looking for space on the left side. She's still motoring. I'll say this, while I'm sure they'd love to have Sarah Wolf on their running back roster, she was lost to an ACL injury. Cheese is making up for it nicely. That was a great acquisition by the Minnesota Machine. And again, I want to look at the Iowa defense. They're, they're going to make their adjustments in the second half. Much like Seattle did against Minnesota on the road, even though it took three quarters. You take the first half to warm up and then the second half to make your adjustments and try to finish out the game. By no means, it's only a seven point deficit, by no means is this Iowa team out of it and they're playing like they came here to win. Iowa calls timeout, so it looks like they will talk things over with Isaiah Schoenman and try to make some adjustments that way. 13-15 to go and 
While the, we're at this timeout, let's get a sports page update from you. It, no, was, you, a, it was an interesting uh, week for lacrosse here in Minnesota. We had the uh, boys and girls um, high school championship game that was just down the road in Chanhassen. And the Vanille St. Was it Vanille St. Margaret's? Benel St. Margaret's, yes. Uh, they came. They came ready to play for the boys' team and uh, and defeated the Eden Prairie squad. And then uh, that was on Thursday night. And then the next night, we had Blake. Just uh, I guess you would say, woman handled the uh, Eden Prairie squad. <laughs> so Eden Prairie really came out the losers in the in this week in uh, at least prep sports. And I understand you helped cover those matches for Grand Stadium. Yes, I was the I was a co color commentator on Thursday night, and I was the camera operator on Friday. And we're getting set here. It's third and three. This time it's a play action pass, and it is short. So another fourth down coming up for Minnesota. They're at the 15, so a field goal would be about 32 yards, which is within. It's in. Thompson's. It's within Thompson's range. Uh, but it's getting close to being out of it. It's, it's going to be depending on how well she gets the spot, but it, it looks like they're not going to go for the field goal. They're going to go for the uh, pickup instead. I was also going to say it depends on how confident Willie Howard is in his offense, and they have Cheese in the backfield. She's shown a lot early. They give it to her again. Ooh, this is going to be close. It's going to be depending on the spot. I think she's a little short, but we'll check. And they're gonna call for the chains. Well, here comes the chain gang. I think that's the first time all year, at least in our games, that we've seen a measurement. Saw a couple of measurements last year, but I don't recall one this year. First down for the Minnesota Machine. Hannah Cheese doing big things and another big conversion for the Machine. With 13 minutes and four seconds remaining in the first half. And if you go back to her high school days with Minneapolis South, doesn't have to change colors either. In fact, we have a clip of her high school days against St. Paul Central in the Twin Cities game, which we'll show you at halftime. It also shows a very young me doing play-by-play. -play. I don't know if I want to, I might have to do some editing. But a fresh set of downs for the machine as Merriman drops back to pass. She's in trouble and had nowhere to go. She does get within the range of Katie Flynn, so no intentional grounding, but Iowa is getting better and better at defensive penetration. Now, it was brought up during our last broad, after our last broadcast by one of our viewers, wondering if this team actually practices in pads. The comment was that it looked like the players know how to catch the ball, but with the extra bulk associated with the pads, that, um, that that's one of the reasons why they don't catch that many. And I'll explain my conversation with Coach Howard after this play. It's second and 10. This time they run to Alt and, well, it's actually Cheese. I thought it was Alt and Cheese gets within the 10. They spot her at about the eight yard line. So. What was well? I asked, I asked Coach Howard if they practiced, if they indeed practiced in pads, and he said yes. But we only get one day of practice per week, so even with the pads on, and he said we practice in pads. Uh, the fact is, I think a lot of it for some of the younger players, the first-year players, just that extra bulk. They just don't have enough time uh, in the pads to really show for it in the game. But I think with more experience, that'll come with time. Third and six. Minnesota can cross the two and not score a touchdown. No, they won't cross that either. Merriman wrapped up quickly by the Iowa defensive line. Field goal. Now you, and now I hear Willie Howard yelling field goal. That's well within Thompson's range. And I'd say that's a smart play here because if you make it, you go up by two positions. If you miss, Iowa hasn't shown they can be a threat yet on offense. And it looks like it's gonna be a 25 yard attempt. Ball's at the eight, so about seven, eight yards for the snap. Yeah. About 20, 25. Well, they have her lined up at the 11. This will be a 21 yarder. Okay, they got the ball on the six. Okay. 
21-yard field goal attempt, high snap, but Thompson gets the kick in cleanly, and, and it's it pure. Good. Minnesota goes up to a 10 to nothing lead over the Iowa Explosion with 11.07 remaining in the first half. Iowa's not panicking yet, but they know that they've got some work that they've really got to do. If they can even get so much as that field goal back by the end of the half, they'll still be in, good, in a good situation to win this as long as they do not give up any more points to the Minnesota machine. On that last uh, possession by Iowa, it was ruined by an uh, interception. And so you're, the Iowa offense has not had that much time on the field in this particular ballgame. And so Minnesota, of course, now having three points off turnovers, getting that field goal off the interception, and Thompson getting her first kick in of the day. I did talk to her pregame. She said on their two-game road trip, she actually missed a 37-yard attempt, so her range is still, or her career long is still 37, of course, making that two years ago. And she'll get better with time. Look out, Mason Crosby. <laughs> or, uh, or wait, now I can't remember the Vi the former Packer kicker and the Viking kicker. Uh, Ryan Longwell. Yes, Longwell. Longtime friend of Brett Favre. This lockout is starting to drive me crazy. <laughs> Minnesota kicks again, another short kick, and it goes out of bounds. So Iowa 49. will start there. Now with Thompson kicking this short to as out of respect or concern about bullying or perhaps the return. I, I think that was an organized uh, short play. I think they were going to try to get the ball back right away, but it just didn't work out in this particular instance. An onside kick. That's the second time we've seen that, and the second time it's gone out of bounds. And I don't think they are going to use that strategy all game against the Kansas City Tribe, but, uh, well, one more game after this, I suppose. Willie Howard's going to try out some new things since they're in a position to secure a playoff spot, but Iowa with short field position. 11.05 in the first half. It is first and 10 on the Minnesota 49. Axley with split backs, but she has a... Almost I, picked off. I was going to say she had... Dickinson wide open, but with the coverage, number eight, Katrina Stewart. And as you said, she almost had a pick. Now, you mentioned Willie Howard, the team's defensive coordinator, as well as the head coach. And so that keeps him a busy man on game day. Iowa going with the same formation, split backs. And this time they hand off to Bowling. Bowling finds a hole, gets to the 40-yard line. The 41. Don't mark it on the 41. Eight-yard gain. Or four-yard gain, I should say. That would be an eight-yard gain. They have it third and seven. They have a new, uh, an, in, an interim uh, game day ops person running the uh, scoreboard tonight. And um, they're a little bit behind the curve. Or maybe, or maybe they gave them some yardage after the penalty. And it's a pitch to bowling this time as she works her way around the machine defenders and gets enough for the first down. She had three machine defenders pursuing her and she smoothly jukes them. Jennifer Bowling, as you call the heart and soul of this Iowa team, showing no less of it even under their new name. If Iowa goes through another reorganization, they might as well just call it the Iowa Bowling. <laughs> She's the thunder and the explosion for this team so far. Well, that leaves out lightning. 10 minutes to go in quarter number two. Bowling was named, of course, to the All-Star game last year. Axling to throw, going for Dickinson, too strong. Second and 10 for the explosion. And we could have had an interesting premise, which didn't occur after uh, Lisa Bastian left, as I remember talking to her at the end of last season, and she mentioned how she would, 
was uh, setting a goal of competing with bowling in terms of yardage gain, but I'd say Minnesota doing a good job of that by committee. You don't ha have to have one star if you've got several. Well, it's depth, and the depth is what any team is looking forward to. We'll try again. It's second and ten, and bowling in trouble. But she goes right. And she's finding She's a got hole. some blocking. Not for long. Mary Walwood wraps her up. And she didn't have much of a chance with Minnesota punching through the line. And I noticed Nell Galehouse looked down at her, pretty much asking how you feel. <laughs> well, one difference between the men's game and the women's game is that on a play like that, a woman is usually more apt to wonder, how are you feeling? Did I, you know, are you hurt? Are you doing okay? Where a guy would step on you. Four yard loss and third and 14 for the explosion. Lights not on yet, but the sun not as harsh. Four wide receivers actually looking to throw, going left. And the pass is behind number four. Dornkamp. Yes. Christine Dornkamp. I don't know if she lost the ball or if Axlein put a little too much air on it, but it hit her back. Well, no. Doran Camp is listed on uh, on the media guide as a quarterback, and that's when she was put in as a slot receiver. Fourth and 14. I was has entered enemy territory a few times, but they haven't found a way to score points off of it. Actually, looking to throw again, and this time it's complete. And look who has the reception. It's Jennifer Bowling, and she gets more than enough for a first down as they spot her close to the 18-yard line. 19-yard gain officially for Bowling on that catch and the heart and soul beating a few more times. Well, I have to say that the Iowa team has been really patient. They've been mixing things up. Uh, even with a high snap on that particular pay, uh, play, they still managed to get the completion, get the first down, and here we are trying for another. Actually, and again to throw. <laughs> Incomplete. <laughs> she was rushed, and I don't think she was able to find Doran Camp because of that. So it's second and 10 with eight minutes to go. Iowa entering the red zone for the first time today. Now we should mention today is kids day for the Minnesota machine. Anyone 17 or under got into the game for free, which did not include us. <laughs> second and 10. Two receivers on either side. Axling going left, looking for Dorenkamp. Finally a catch and a touchdown. touchdown. Axling was not going to give up on Dorenkamp and it pays off there, Iowa on the board. No time ticked off the clock, or one second did, so. One second off the clock, 7.59 remaining in the first half. That play began with eight minutes. That has okay, to be now they take off more time, so it's 7.54 remaining. They took off an additional five seconds. I was going to say, that would have been the longest one-second play I've ever seen. Jennifer Bowling lining up for the extra point. A 17-yard touchdown reception by Dorenkamp. And Bowling will add the seventh point on that kick. So 10-7 with 7.54 to go. And Iowa doesn't take long to get themselves back in it. Like I said, after the Minnesota field goal, what Iowa needed to do was just Minnesota focus on news. keeping Ross their offense on the field, advancing the chains, and getting well, a score, whether it be a touchdown or a field goal. And with a fourth down and Minnesota long situation, machine. that 18-yard strike to bowling was crucial. They even gave Iowa a little bit of momentum, kind of demoralized the Minnesota defense for just a couple of plays, enough to get the ball into Doran Camp for that touchdown. So we're now dealing with only a three-point deficit when we stop plenty of time in this game. Two key plays on that drive. Minnesota's onside attempt 
that fell way short, gave Iowa a short field and that fourth down conversion when Bowling made uh, that 19 yard reception. I'm not sure if Minnesota will be trying any more onside kicks unless they have to now. Well, the 10, 10 or nothing lead, you've got a little bit of a cushion to be able to experiment with something like that. With the three point lead, if they come out with another field goal or nothing, then they may just go for the long kick. If they come out with a touchdown, I, I, it would not surprise me to see Willie Howard call that again. Bowling to kick off. It's a short squib kick, and Minnesota is going to let that go out of bounds. And we haven't had too many kicks in bounds today. Minnesota will start at the 40. Well, as we mentioned in our last home game, that oblong ball leads to some crazy bounces, and that's why we don't see the drop kick rule anymore being used. That's what it was called, correct? Drop that kick. Is, that's what it was called. Uh, back in the uh, early 1920s and 30s, the uh, ball was more resemblance of a kickball or a basketball. A lot of times you'd seen the stat, stat books, a lot of uh, drop kicks. I believe a drop kick counted as two points. And it was like a punt. You, the uh, kicker would get the ball, drop it once on the ground, and on its rebound back up, kick it in between the uprights. With the different shape, that's kind of gone out of style. Merriman looking to throw, finds Bauman. Works away around the defender. Oh, that was great timing from that catch, and she works away to the 45 before she's tackled by Steffi. So a 15-yard gain in Minnesota showing no signs of fear after Iowa's touchdown. Don't think we're going to see any drop kicks in this game, Mike. <laughs> I know you mentioned that to Danielle Thompson following the machine stampede game, and I believe she knew about that rule as well. She did, which really surprised me. Uh, we had not uh, discussed that before, and she kind of looked up at me and smiled with this, I ought to try that sometime look, but in game situations, you don't just come and do that indiscriminately. And she knows that. Hand off to Cersei on first down. Cersei gets five yards before she's tackled. Run up the middle by Cersei for a five-yard game. I really like the development of Cersei's running game so far today. We didn't see her get a lot of momentum against Nebraska, and today she hasn't had a lot of big breaks, but she's getting four yards here, five yards here, and setting things up for Hannah Cheese when they put her in under center. Kind of reminds me of the old run and shoot offense. It almost seems like Cersei wears them out and Cheese takes advantage of their energy. Cersei again finds another hole. That's good enough for a first down. She cut left after she saw a hole open in that first wave and she gets the first down out of it. Nothing fancy, two five yard gains, but Machine will take it. Well, Green Bay Packer legendary coach Vince Lombardi had a philosophy that he developed when he was with the New York Giants. It might have been when he was an assistant coach with Notre Dame or with um, the with West Point with the uh, Army Academy. It was run to daylight. If the plan does not go as executed, find the hole, find it on your own. And his philosophy led him to the Hall of Fame. This time, Merriman keeps it herself and picks up four yards. I'm not sure if that was a draw play or a broken play, but four-yard gain is a four-yard gain. We're at second and six with just over five minutes remaining in the first half. Minnesota Machine with a 10 to seven lead over the Iowa explosion in WFA action. And I can't tell you how Merriman is doing because they don't have stats on her this season, at least not much. But I was told she really developed in that last game against the Wisconsin Dragons. This time she lines up under the shotgun as she's looking to throw it. And a picked off by... Or you try to get a number. And that evens up in a turnover battle. Wait a second, was there a fumble? There was a fumble, was Minnesota. Interception with a fumble. Hannah Cheese comes up with the fumble recovery. Incredible. Anna Cheese making her mark early. Oh, she loves the orange and black. Wow. Still have no idea who was credited with the interception, but that fumble recovery was crucial. 
for this Minnesota Machine Squad. Now, how does that work? Do they reset the downs? Looks that way, first and 10, because it was an interception. Because it was an interception with so a change of possession there so with the fumble. Two change of possessions two there. Two changes so of possession. It's a new possession. So it's first down and 10 with the ball on the Iowa 36 yard line. Almost a do over. Merriman hands off and we'll get a number on the runner, but she didn't go far, gains a yard. That's number 28, Lexi Tolley. Well, during that last that last play, the, the turnover, you could see Willie Howard running onto the field, yelling and pointing his hand that we've got the possession. And then he stomped off the field, turned around and looked, and that's when the officials gave it to them. Now, don't you love those, the ever rare dual turnovers on one play? <laughs> Merriman. I don't know if that was broken or not, but she gets a few yards out of it. From here, it didn't look like she was ready for the snap. No, she did not look like she was ready for the snap, but the ball came to her. She just did the best she could with it and still advanced. Looks like we may have an injury out there. Timeout, Minnesota. 3.41 to go. That's their first of the half, and timeouts do not carry over, so use them or lose them. And it looks like Aaron Wilson for Iowa was slow to get up on that play, but she's standing upright and now walking off the field. I think she just took an extra few seconds of a rest. And we should point out, not a lot of Iowa players getting rest today. They did not send as large of a roster to Minnesota this year as they did last year. Coming up at half time, About a third of their players the on the official roster kids. are not here today, so more two-way starters for the explosion, but it's a program you'd like to see continue on after some ownership problems last year. So the players aren't giving up and they're determined to continue to bring professional football to Iowa in a, some way, shape, or form. Of course, Iowa has no NFL team. But they do have a NASCAR facility. What I'd like to know is if you're in Iowa, do you cheer for the Chicago Bears, Minnesota Vikings, Green Bay Packers, or the Kansas City Chiefs? That's a tough one. Perhaps our Iowa fans watching this broadcast can let us know. Well, it looks like we've got... That's a play's whistle dead. Play is whistle dead. There was movement on the line. There was movement on the line. You still have to give credit to Merriman, even with the uh, with the whistle, she was still going towards the end zone, just in case. It was encroachment, and that automatically whistles the play dead, but as you said, just in case, she goes for it. But it, instead of a third and seven facing the machine, it's now third and two, as Iowa commits their first penalty of the day. Now you mentioned that the uh, that Iowa has a lot of 60-minute men today. That was actually the standard in football, high school, college, and pro up until World War II. That the substitutions were limited, they were rare, and most players, if you came out, you couldn't get back in until the next quarter began. So they were playing both sides of the ball. Merriman handing off to Alt, and Alt is wrapped up quickly. There's another fumble. And it looks like Minnesota fell on it, but we'll check. They did as they signal fourth down. And it looks like we've got uh, Michelle Goodman for the machine is down. And Maggie Alt, slow to get up. Michelle Goodman. Goodman. Michelle Goodman, number 24. Now <laughs> when they pile up down there, it's hard to see who's who. You, you just saw the four, didn't you? Yes. She looked like she was clutching her knee. Machine calling up for water. And so the ball kids obliging. Ball kids, of course, wearing the white jerseys. Yes. I wonder if they're the same size as the orange jerseys. We're waiting to know more of the condition of Goodman. 
323 left in the second quarter. We should point out there is a two minute warning for new fans of the WFA. The timing and rules are similar to the NFL. And oh, it, that was Alt. It was Alt. Yeah, number 34. Oh, I was wrong. My, my apologies to everybody. <laughs> Just when she had uh, tried getting up, it looked like it was 24 on the jersey. Uh, I did. I evidently did not see it correctly. And Again, I see, that's just I my eyesight Goodman. leaving me here as I get older. <laughs> because now I see Goodman on the bench, so she wasn't out there. But yeah, Alt uh, got piled on following the fumble. She took a nasty hit, and I talked to her pregame, and she was excited to play Iowa again. But uh, this is definitely a setback for the machine. They've already had to make a few changes to their running backs this season. Again, they lost Sarah Wolf in the second game of the year. And now Maggie Alt could be out for the remainder of the season. But And then you see Desiree Hofschult, Hofschulte right next to her on crutches. So this team has really battled some injury adversities over the years. Including the quarterback position. There it is, the pickoff. And this it's is a fourth fumble. down. And it looks like Iowa has recovered. They would have recovered anyway because it was a would have been a turnover on downs, but Iowa will take a turnover the old-fashioned way. Defensive With, tackle Mary Lou Warner came in and uh, jumped on that ball and picks up the recovery. So both teams now with two turnovers, and Iowa has a chance to take the lead. They have a short field to work with. With only th less than three minutes to go in the first half. Two timeouts plus the two-minute warning. Iowa has an eternity. And Bowling proved she could march her way down the field. And don't forget, Dorenkamp had the touchdown reception. So now how does Minnesota respond? They've had a couple issues in this possession, coughing it up twice. First and 10, Maxlein. It's a handoff going nowhere. Look who's there, Jessica Patnode, among the host of machine tacklers as they look to hand it off to Lulu Kiltai. Seven yard loss. Nell Gellhaus. What, what would serve Iowa really well right now is if, they, if their center actually got the snap a little bit lower. Uh, right now, the quarterback has to keep jumping up on the snap. That's the waste of valuable second or two, and then that gives the machine defense enough time to come in and stop them in the backfield. And I believe that's Olivia Zio uh, Ziola is a defensive back and the center. This time it's a screenplay with a good snap. And bowling going right. She gets to the 40, 40 yard line. gain of one. Once again, doing her best to find space and Minnesota doing a great job plugging it. Brought down by Mary Walworth. Long third down coming up. We have hit the two minute warning with 148 to go. And that sets up an interesting scenario here. Iowa had the first possession of this game. So Minnesota will get the ball to start the second half. But if Minnesota can get a stop here, I don't know if Iowa would go for it, but do you look to your two timeouts and try well, to get something thing, going? The first thing you have to look at is, is getting the ball down the field. You got 148 to get into the red zone. Uh, you try to pick up the score by that time. If you're still at midfield, depends on how things are working for you as to whether or not you use that timeout. But right now, being third and 16 with the ball on your own 40, you know you've got time to march it down the field but you're still fighting the clock and you're also fighting the downs. Two minutes and as we'd like to remind you, at halftime we'll have some clips of Hannah Cheese from her former basketball playing days and of course we'll have the second half for you as we take a little flashback. 10-7 is our score. And a big third down coming up for the explosion. It's another pitch to Bowling. Bowling has space, gets to midfield, and is taken out of bounds at the 46-yard line. That will be short of the first down, but that makes it an easier fourth down for Iowa, who I imagine will go for it now. With fourth and two, you're not in field goal range yet. You've still got time on the clock. If they can convert this first down, 
and there's still an opportunity to pick up that score and come into this with at least a tie ball game. But we have an Iowa player down, and that could change things. Do we also best have to get a, a number? We also have a penalty flag on that play. That play came at the 40, so we'll check the marker and we'll check to see which player took the hit for Iowa. It looks like that one may be coming back, and it is a costly penalty. It looks like it's holding based on what I see on the scoreboard, third and 26. From their own 30. That's a safe bet that it was a holding call. A killer penalty nonetheless. And it looks like it was Bowling who went down, but I can't quite see. Yes, it yes, was. Yes, it was Bowling. And so she'll have to sit out this play. And that was key actually last year when Minnesota scored what was uh, their first touchdown of the game. Bowling got injured. She had to sit out the next play. She was fine, of course, but that allowed Sarah Bishop to get that pick and run to Pater. The clock is restarted. 135 um. and counting. Third and 26 after the holding call. And no bowling as, of course, she has to sit out for at least one play. Watch the snap on this. If it's a low snap, another high snap. Actually, with time, though, going deep. Incomplete Too strong. pass. We're at fourth and 26. Doran Camp again the intended target, and I don't think Iowa will be going for it this time. That holding call was crucial for Iowa on that last possession. And they send out the punting unit. Instead of fourth and two, it became third and 26. Tough to overcome. Just their second penalty, but a killer second penalty, and that gives Minnesota, that'll give them about a minute, provided they can field it and not turn over here on this return. With two timeouts, they could make a march down the field for one more score. Low snap, low punt, and not even close to Abby Smith, who just lets it go out of bounds. So Minnesota will have 109 to work with, and they will start at their own 47-yard line. Only 53 yards to pay dirt. Plenty of time and two timeouts left. I could see Minnesota going for one more strike. Now the question is, are they going to get into field goal range and try to get Thompson the opportunity for another three, or are they going to make it all the way into the end zone? With 59 seconds, oh, they got to really execute. It's still 109. Oh, excuse me, I'm at 69. <laughs> Let's see what they do. Again, they have two timeouts as they go to Cheese. Cheese trying to break through tackles. He does break through a couple. Four progress puts her at the 50. Clock is ticking. Now we're down below four, 59. <laughs> 50 seconds left now, and Minnesota going to the hurry up. Forty seconds. Down to 34 seconds. A lot of time ticked off. 50 yards away from the score. Geez, trying to turn the corner. And she will run out of bounds. That stops the clock. They spot her. Oh, I can't see. There's a lot of officials over there. They spot her uh, at the, the 39. 37? 30, 30, yeah, it is a 39. 39. And the clock stops with 25 seconds left. So an 11-yard game by Cheese. And Minnesota does not have to burn one of their two timeouts left. They get the ball to start the second, of course, but they'd like to get at least a field goal before they head to the locker room. They have a few more yards to go before they're within Thompson's range. They try again with Cheese, and the hole wraps up quickly, taken out at the 36, and now Minnesota will use one of their final two timeouts. 20 seconds left. Interesting decision here by Minnesota to run the ball here. Are they trying to 
make it so if they don't score, Iowa doesn't have any time left? Well, I think their game plan so far has been run-oriented. They've been making the holes. They've been hitting the holes. They've been making some long gangs. I think that uh, Coach Howard was trying to find a soft spot, enough to pick up some yardage, especially with Cheese, who's having a really great game so far, and try to stop the clock by going out of bounds. Now with 20 seconds left, a second eight, it would still be a 51 yard attempt for Thompson, which is way out of her range. So with 20 seconds left, I would expect to see a pass play here unless the Minnesota machine are just gonna try to run out the clock. It's second and eight. Thank you, we have 10 kids. And it looks like they will have a pie-eating contest at halftime for the kids. Mmm, pie. <laughs> I'm still full. Well, that's in the words of Homer Simpson. Let's see what they do here. It is a passing play. And Bauman picks it up, gets to the 30, but not out of bounds. So Minnesota has to burn their final timeout. But with 13 seconds left, makes sense. Now, this gets interesting. You have no more timeouts, so you can't use the middle of the field as much. And you're at fourth down. It's a fourth and short. I see three, though, on the down and distance. Fourth and one. Scoreboard says fourth and one. Yay. The PA announcer said fourth and one. The sideline marker He's Reads third down. Daryl left in his duty. I think he's getting more wrapped up in his conversation than his duty. In any case, it's a big play. They reset to third down. Merriman going back. And nowhere near is Katie Flynn. Now it's fourth down. With nine seconds left, I have to figure this will be the last play of the game or the half. I was going to say, what happened in the second half? In any case, we do have fourth down. Now, if this was the last play of the game, they would have taken a, well, they wouldn't have taken a knee already because they would have to convert one more time. But fourth and one, nine seconds left. This figures to be the last play of the half, barring a defensive penalty. Three receivers on the left, including Cheese. Merriman looking that way, but goes right instead, and it is almost Ooh. picked off. We've got, we a got a flag, flag late with five seconds. That could be a hold, but we'll check. Could also be pass interference. Now, that was closer to the line of scrimmage. They're walking this one back. Now, it was fourth down, so Iowa could choose to decline the penalty. It's a chop block on Minnesota. And if they did, they would get the ball with five seconds left. And they do decline the penalty. So a turnover on downs, and Iowa has one chance for what will be a Hail Mary. In this case, a Hail Christine. <laughs> Doran Hale Camp Christine a, Doran Camp. Doran Camp getting a lot of looks, but Bowling had that big reception on fourth down that led to Iowa's touchdown later, so. Hail Jennifer. That's possible. I am pretty sure they will not be hailing to you. At least I don't not think in that so. sense. Or maybe if the Enterprise is built uh, pretty soon, they might hail you that way. Hail me for a taxi cab. <laughs> or taxi, or bus. Five seconds. Last play of the half. High snap again. Axling going deep, and it's incomplete. That and brings us to the time end. Time expires. It is 10 to 7. Minnesota Machine leading the Iowa Explosion at halftime at Einer Anderson Stadium in beautiful Minnetonka, Minnesota. Bowling was the intended receiver, but in a first half that started out quickly for the machine, Iowa found a way to bounce back, and it's playing out like the rivalry we've come to see in the last couple of years. Things are heating up. Expect to see an explosive second half. Both teams are, are, are they've probed. 
Both teams have probed their opponent. Now, let's see how they respond to each other on the field in the second half. We'll take a break. Right now, we'll take you to a flashback of Hannah Cheese in her high school days playing for Minneapolis South, and then we'll come back to start the second half. We come to you from Minneapolis South High School as Keystone Productions proudly presents the high school girls basketball Twin Cities Championship. Today's matchup could prove to be the game of the year as two schools battle for breaking rights in the Twin Cities with the St. Paul Central Minutemen, champions of the St. Paul City Conference, and the Minneapolis South Tigers, champions of the Minneapolis City Conference. She did not up on her butt. Here we go, coming in for South, number 32, Hannah Cheese. Misses both. Now, that, now you would call that a really good foul, but South is trapped. A foul on Central. The Central fans are booing, the South fans are cheering. Too short. Georgie Rebound. Jones with the block. Rebound Buford. And Black cannot get a handle on it. Here comes Ephesia Holmes. Georgie Jones. Shot, no good, that was well short. Aisha Smith takes a shot herself, short. Rebound. That cheese. Was Hannah and Cheese, who cleaned up the mess. And now she has a two, three on two, but she can't convert. Nice pre effort, and South will get the rebound to Aisha Smith for three, but that was off balance. Cheese coming up with it. And, and foul called on Central. I'm thinking that's going to be on number 30, Buford. And it is. That's her third. She's in foul trouble. She's on the line for two. She's averaging 4.9 points per game this season. I think we can attribute that miss to the cheerleaders. Cheese, one of two. Hill for three. Bullseye! You're right, she's been part of most of those traps there. And looks like Willie Taylor just sent another girl to get her. Cheese sinks her first. Hill looking to take it herself, got it inside, but she couldn't get the two. Hannah Cheese with the rebound. Taylor really not even a presence in this half court game. Cheese with the pull up and two. With less than a minute to go. Hannah Cheese gets a basket. Welcome back to Einer Anderson Stadium as TSB Television continues its coverage of WFA football. We have a cross-state rivalry between the Iowa Thunder, or Iowa Explosion, and the Minnesota Machine, the Explosion formerly named the Thunder, as Minnesota holds a 10-7 lead to start the second half. I'm Mike Peden, joined by Jeff Williams, and Jeff, you had some observations after a crazy first half in which Minnesota turned over the ball a couple times in one possession. They scored a touchdown, field goal. Iowa came back after getting a fumble recovery, and it's been crazy. First thing, let's talk about Maggie Alt. She went out in the second quarter with what appears to be a knee injury. I talked to Willie Howard. She will not be returning for the second half, but the good news is that she is able to actually have some lateral movement there. So the prognosis is actually pretty good for recovery compared to if there was no movement whatsoever. Now also, this coaching staff is really fired up defensively. They are not accepting a three-point lead. They think that they're good enough to literally bury the Iowa explosion. They want to come out on this second half with a defensive-minded squad and literally bury the explosion. This coaching staff is not happy. Willie Howard himself came out and said that he expects to see at least five sacks in the second half. He knows that this team can perform better and it's now with 30 more minutes of play to see if they will live up to his high expectations for them. Well, Iowa will kick off to start the second half and it was going in Minnesota's direction. They built a 10-0 lead and then the wheels came off a little bit. 
you had a interception that Hannah Cheese was able to scoop back and pick up a fumble recovery on, but then Maggie Alt, who on the play that got her hurt, coughs up the ball and then turns it over to Mary Lou Warner and Iowa march down the field after that. So they get ready for the kickoff. It's going to be a defensive grudge match. Watch to see what kind of adjustments that Iowa makes because I got a feeling that they're not happy coming into the second half with the three-point deficit. And this kick stays in bounds for Abby Smith. And Smith with room to run on the right side. One woman to beat. We got a play. It could be a block. So Smith goes in for a touchdown, but just like the game with Nebraska, this one may be called back. Smith just can't seem to get a break. And she had one person to beat, too. I thought she was clear on and home. And it's coming back. Illegal block in the back. Once again, Smith, another touchdown called back. She just can't catch a break in that regard. She had an, a punt return for a touchdown called back against Nebraska. But Minnesota will get good field position to start their first possession of the second half. Even if she can't get a break now, she will get one to pay off eventually. We've got one more regular season gain, and if the machine can hold off here and next week against the Wisconsin Wolves, we'll still have playoff opportunities, and therefore, there's still at least two more games if they get in the playoffs for her to break one back without having to come back on a penalty. And we should point out, as Jeff goes to get his pictures for sports page, it's very difficult on those kick returns. A lot of it is bang, bang, we're not excusing the players by any means, but it's very difficult to get the timing down and the blocks in when things are moving so quickly. And we have another flag on the first play of the second half as Hannah Cheese gets the carry. And it looks like we have offsides against Iowa. And we do. So Iowa committing a penalty not long after Minnesota gets the block in the back. So Iowa not starting poised either. That will make the play first and five. And to recap that first half in terms of scoring plays, Yolanda Searcy got things started with a six yard touchdown run. We had a 21 yard field goal from Danielle Thompson to make it 10 nothing. And as Cheese gets the carry again to pick up maybe a yard, we had a 19-yard touchdown reception from Courtney Axleem to Christine Dornkamp. And that makes our score 10 to seven as we begin the third quarter. And to reset the playoff picture for you, if you've just joined us, Minnesota, if they win, they control their destiny. If they lose and Wisconsin wins, the Wisconsin Wolves, I should say, that would set up a winner-take-all next week here at Einar Anderson Stadium between the Machine and the Wolves because they'd have identical records. If both teams win or lose, then Minnesota is in control and Wisconsin would need a little help. Pitch to Cheese. Cheese looking for space on the left side. Does turn the corner but doesn't go far. That will bring up second and about three. And the reason why the Wisconsin Wolves wouldn't need help, they would have to beat Minnesota and win by 22 points or more to get the tiebreaker. And that's if both teams win or lose tonight. So a lot of scenarios could play out, but for Minnesota, the long story short, win and you control your destiny. Whoever wins the upper Midwest division would go on to play the Midwest division champions, the Kansas City Tribe. And that's not looking too rosy at the moment, given how the Tribe have rolled over their opponents in the Midwest Division. But anything can happen in the game of football, and right now the focus is on this game and not two games ahead. And just as I say that, Mandy Merriman with a bad snap, and Iowa with a fumble recovery. With the recovery, Cindy Taft, that's the third turnover of the game for the machine, and that is not how Willie Howard wanted to start things. It turning ugly for the machine after they were rocking to start this game. They scored 10 points in the first quarter and since then the wheels have come off.
Machine fans and their team have to consider themselves lucky. They're still leading by three with their three turnovers, but Iowa has coughed it up twice, making the turnover margin. Minus one for the Machine. Bowling with the catch. Jukes her first defender, but Bishop takes her down from behind. She had broken number 13, Daniel Thompson, and it had that not been for Bishop, Bowling would have gone away for the touchdown. Again, she is a dangerous threat at any time for the explosion. First down regardless as they get the ball at the 35-yard line. 18-yard gain unofficially. Axling lining up in the shotgun with Bowling behind. And Bowling, of course, can play receiver, can play running back, and she kicks as well. The heart and soul of this team for Iowa. They pitch to Bowling, who's going to try to go right, has some space, and pushes her way to the 35-yard gain. With the tackle, Shalonda Williams. Second and five. Minnesota and Iowa coming in with identical records. Iowa won the first meeting of the season on their home turf, beating Minnesota seven to nothing. Iowa sticking to the shotgun. This time, Minnesota brings the blitz. Patno trying to get to Bowling, and they do. Bowling and Bishop wrap her up behind the line of scrimmage for what will be about a two-yard loss. They call it third and six. Third and nine now. So a four-yard loss. Third and a short nine, anyway. Minnesota realizing, though, Bowling is slowly firing up and getting ready to turn on those jets. She almost broke away for a touchdown earlier in this possession. They feed it to her again. She breaks the first tackle. Now has room to run, looking for the first down, and she punches her way forward to get to the 20. Good enough for another first down. Bowling, what more can you say about her? A big third down conversion. As she showcases why she was selected to the all-star roster last year for the American Conference. Lisa Olson, the team's owner, now going out there to take this snap on defense. As you might have guessed from our earlier discussion, a huge Green Bay Packers fan. And she's hoping Minnesota can hold serve much like Green Bay did in Super Bowl 45. Axling going again to bowling, and why not? Patno wraps her up this time for a short game. And Roberts and Baker now going in as Karen Richardson will take a seat for the machine. Second and eight coming up. 9-13 left in the third quarter. I'd like to remind you, thesportsbrain1.blogspot.com is where you can go to order DVD copies of this game and all our Minnesota Machine games from the 2011 season. Of course, we'll have the highlight film later this fall when the Machine season concludes, whenever that is. Split backs this time for Iowa on second and eight. And it's another handoff to Bowling. Gets to the 19, no gain. Baker with the tackle, they do give her one. Third and seven. Bowling had a huge third down conversion on the last play. We'll see if she can do it again. This would be big if Minnesota could hold after coughing the ball up, following a bad snap. Split backs again. This time it's a play action. Axling going deep and it's almost picked off by Abby Smith. 
Smith couldn't quite get her hands on it. Not in position, but she would have had a big pick otherwise, as Dorenkamp was well in front of the ball. Fourth and seven, Iowa will go for it here, of course, being in the red zone. Big fourth down as Iowa can take the lead with a touchdown. And given the momentum swing, that would be a huge killer for Minnesota. Play action again, Axling under pressure. Hit as she throw, but the pass is complete. Just short of the goal line. First and goal coming up, a huge reception by Iowa on fourth down and seven. Ashley Dickinson with a 17-yard catch. Iowa has first and goal at the one. Everything going Iowa's way since the second quarter. Lining up in the shotgun. Interesting play call here, but it's worked for Iowa in the last few plays. Axling under pressure again. Doesn't matter. No, it's incomplete. I thought it was caught. I thought it was caught. Dickinson had a chance to scoop it in for the touchdown, but it did not pay off. Axling under pressure again. And somewhat unfortunate Minnesota couldn't get that sack because that gave them a little more room to breathe defensively speaking 7-16 left in the third quarter Iowa looking to take their first lead of the game they've responded to the challenge well after going down by 10 early in the first quarter Axling, handoff, touchdown, Iowa. With the touchdown run of one yard, can't quite get a name. It's Jennifer Bowling, who else would it be? Bowling with her first rushing touchdown. Well, no, not maybe, it wasn't Bowling. I couldn't read the name. I can't see the numbers. It's a touchdown regardless. Iowa takes their first lead of the game as they line up for the extra point. Jennifer Bowling to kick. Clean snap, and the kick is blocked. No extra point for Iowa, so a small consolation for Minnesota and a very critical one because the lead is only three. 13-10 with 7-11 left. A one-yard touchdown run by Iowa, but Minnesota blocks the extra point, which means a field goal will be good enough to tie it. But even with the blocked extra point, it's clear the momentum has gone completely in Iowa's direction. And that could really shake up the playoff picture. Again, Maggie Ulf not available for the rest of the game. She scored the game's only touchdown, of course, in their win over Nebraska. And throughout the season, Minnesota, it's been a tale of two teams. They either can go off on a scoring frenzy or they get shut out or held to a low score. Of course, with Chicago, they were shut out 69 to nothing. They had a couple big scoring outputs in their next two games. They lost to Iowa 7-0, they had a 6-0 win over Nebraska, and then they come back with a 46-0 win over the Wisconsin Dragons, the expansion team in the Badger State. So you just never know with this team, but with Iowa, the battles have been close the last three years, or the last three games. And it appears the fourth game in this series will be just the same as bowling with a short kick to Dawn Schmidt, who fields it cleanly and wisely goes down as she didn't have any blocking help. 
Minnesota will get a short field to work with starting at the 47. We'd like to remind you that our next telecast is the final regular season home game of the 2011 Minnesota Machine season. And that will be against the Wisconsin Wolves, as we pointed out many times with the playoff scenario in a game that could have huge implications depending on the outcome of this game. This time it's a clean snap. Merriman goes to Cheese. He finds some space quickly and gets to the 40, a seven yard gain. Yes. Minnesota would love to repeat and with the expansion of the WFA this year and the new alignments, the playoff format is set up as such where you have to win the division in order to take a playoff spot. Only division, team, division champions qualify this year. There are no wild cards. Second and three. Cersei with the carry this time. And Cersei, where do they spot her? And there's a little scrum afterwards. Cersei with the carry. Stopped after a one yard gain. One yard, third and third two. Now walking into the rushing game is not an uncommon strategy in the WFA with many teams going run oriented. The passing game still developing, not that strong yet, so you will not see many passes. It's usually a lot of runs. And Iowa's figured that out as they go again to Cheese, who has the first down, but we have a flag close to the line first of scrimmage. Could be Cheese, illegal motion. No, it's offsides against Iowa. That penalty will be declined. And a first down Offside, is a result. Down, a five-yard gain by Hannah Cheese, who is making a huge splash in her home debut for the Orange and Black. Coincidentally, that offsides penalty would have given Minnesota a first down anyway. 5.25 and counting. Play action this time, Merriman, incomplete. Bauman was the intended receiver, but Ali Milanig was there on the coverage. Second down and 10. Second and 10. Merriman just not finding a lot of rhythm on the air. They're giving Cheese a rest. They have Cersei in the backfield as they hand it to her at the fullback position. And taking her place as of now appears to be Swan McLeod. Cersei stopped at the line of scrimmage. That makes it third and Both 10. And 10 to go. Minnesota running out of possessions, running out of time. And Iowa showing their versatility on offense via Jennifer Bowling. I think Minnesota wants to get another score here because if Minnesota can't respond, this game could be out of reach. Still a lot of time left, but they need to get that momentum back. Merriman under pressure, and it's incomplete. Katie Flynn ran too far and couldn't get back in time for the reception. We have an injury timeout as a Minnesota player goes down. They send out Daniel Thompson, so they will punt once they get this resolved. I could not see a number but it is definitely an offensive lineman as Kim Miller goes out there to have a word. Miller, a quarterback's coach, has dealt with injury problems over the years and a couple of other things, so that has limited her playing time. But still, a very 
die-hard member of this franchise. The injured player was Susan Brooks. Her nickname is Big Daddy. She'll have to sit out, but she does get up and walk off under her own power. Minnesota will punt. Brooks will sit this play out. Brooks, one of the new additions this year to the 2011 team. Low snap, but Thompson fields it cleanly, gets the punt off cleanly. She's gonna try to get this out of bounds. And look at that, a great down punt. And Katrina line. Stewart gets there in time That's to down it within start. the five. <laughs> they will spot it close to the two. So even though Iowa has Bowling and Dickinson and Doring Camp, they will have to march 98 yards to score again. And Minnesota has proven their medal on defense a few times this game. So it's not over by any means. We should point out that during this playoff push, Lisa Olson, the team's owner, decided to go into mohawk mode, dyed her hair black, went into a mohawk. I have to say she has more guts than I do. Of course, I don't have the hair for a mohawk, but I don't know if I go that route anyway. First and 10 from the two. Maxlene under center again, Iowa, Pinned deep in their territory. They go to Bowling, we have a flag on the play. Bowling does break through to get to the 10, but we'll check the marker. There's a penalty on the play. It looks like the penalty will be against Minnesota. Offsides. Iowa will accept the penalty. It'll be a five-yard penalty. Which makes sense. As Iowa will stay on first down, but Minnesota just losing their confidence, losing their cool since the first quarter ended. They can't buy a break. Of course, they had a touchdown return called back by a block in the back, and that has set the tone so far in the second half as we have 4.16 left. First and five. High snap, Axling. Almost picked off by Sarah Bishop. Well, that would have been a repeat of last year's pick six had Bishop called it in. She had daylight in front of her. Second down and five. Second and five. And as we pointed out throughout the broadcast, Axleen does well when she gets a clean snap in time. But when she gets a high or a low snap and has to take that extra second or two to bring the ball in, she runs into a little trouble. Minnesota usually pounces on that mistake. Second and five. As Iowa will try again. This time it's a handoff to Bowling. Bowling with space. She runs through Minnesota's defenders like they're ping pong balls. First down carry. First Brings down the ball to the 19, so a 13 yard carry unofficially. When you look at the way Jennifer Bowling just weaves through the defenders, it's a second instinct. Even for a shorthanded Iowa team that sends a lot of two-way starters in today, the team shrunk a bit following ownership changes, and Bowling still finds a way to carry the Iowa franchise with her. Axling goes to bowling again. She shakes Richardson. Now she shakes another machine defender. And now Bishop wraps her up, but not before. She gets another with the carry. close to a first down. The stop number 43, Mary, Mary Walworth with the stop, but if Jennifer Bowling can continue to break tackles like this, it will be very Senior difficult for Minnesota to come back and win this game. Three. 
again, Iowa has won their last three games against Minnesota, their last loss to the machine was at Iowa last season. And Minnesota had built enough of a cushion where they were able to take home the division title even though the two teams had identical records because of the point differential. But they have not lost in their last two trips here. Bowling again, that's more than enough for a first down. Two-yard gain. Two yard gain on the play. Stop. Number 90, Sarah Bishop brings up third down and one to go. It's third and one. I miscalculated the gain on the last play. It's third and one, but for bowling, the way she is penetrating the defensive line now, Minnesota may be deeper, but they might be more fatigued. As we see Lisa Olson having a chat with Nicole Feets, who is in street clothes. They bring out the chain gang to confirm, and it's third and inches for bowling that may as well be a millimeter. I imagine they'll feed to her for this third down play. Feets, as we mentioned, tore her ACL during the team's last road trip, and so she will not be suiting up for the last two games of the year. Minnesota, of course, has gone through many quarterbacks in the last couple seasons. Making consistency and rhythm in that position tricky. Third and inches, bowling in the backfield. What are the odds? They feed to her. Minnesota trying to jump the snap. I don't see a flag. And Minnesota gets a stop. No, they get a fumble recovery. They timed the snap perfectly. No flag was called. They were showing blitz. They bring it. And a huge fumble recovery. And that's exactly what Minnesota needed as, as Iowa was looking to put the dagger on them in terms of momentum. I couldn't see who got the fumble recovery. There was a lot of bodies, but that fumble was created by Minnesota's perfect timing of the snap. They were ready, brought the blitz. Iowa had no chance. But Minnesota still trails by three. They have 123 left in the third. Merriman going to Cheese. Cheese looking to break forward, doesn't get much. A spotter She's at the 25. Picks up one on the play. Short game. Correction. No gain. No gain, actually. Again, Minnesota running the ball. Iowa has figured them out, and Minnesota's running core not as strong as Jennifer Bowling is. You have Chi is making her first appearance at home. Got some action in their win against the Wisconsin Dragons, but still a lot of development with her. You have a seasoned veteran in bowling who proved her medal last season. And Minnesota may need to look to the air to keep Iowa's defense honest as they load the box again. Merriman going for a pass, and it's complete. Bowling with the tackle, but not before. A huge reception by Jesse Boyles, the tight end. First down. First down, Minnesota. The ball is spotted at the 14-yard line. 15, 10-yard gain. And we'll see if that keeps Iowa's defense honest as, again, they were loading the box in the last few plays. The winner will be drawn here shortly. So last call. And that will be the last play of the third quarter. Iowa leading 13-10, but Minnesota driving after a fumble recovery. Both teams with three turnovers. Also like to announce that Minnesota Machine merchandise is available right here next to the press box. As the teams switch fields and we enter darkness now, the sun has set at Einer Anderson Stadium. A 
again, the last game of the season against the Wisconsin Wolves. We'll have that broadcast for you on tape delay on TSV television. You can go to the sportsframe1.blogspot.com to pick up a DVD copy of this game. And depending on what happens in this game and what happens with the Wisconsin Wolves, we could have a huge playoff scenario unfold, or it could be a smooth sailing for the machine. But again, if Minnesota wins, they control their destiny. Iowa out of the playoff picture this year. They got to the second round last year in the American Conference before they lost to the eventual champions, the Lone Star Mustangs. And a rather close game. Yolanda Searcy with the carry gets to the eight yard line before she's pushed out of bounds by Bowling. Seven yard gain. Making it second and three. Minnesota driving now. Now Cheese, we should point out, joined this team. She was one of those players that sat in for the Nebraska Stampede game. They were one of the players that wore the road white jerseys to check out the machine and like what she saw. And here she is on TV and has contributed enormously, as has Yolanda Searcy. It's second and four. They rule it a six-yard gain. Cersei trying to turn the corner again, pushing forward. And they stop her at forward progress at the three. Close to it. The officials signal first down. It's first and goal. First and goal. Cersei punched it in the last time Minnesota was this close, getting a six yard touchdown carry. And she gets a pitch on the left, but she cuts back right and has nowhere to go. Iowa wraps her up nicely. Two yard loss on the play. Second and goal from the five coming up and a pretty big pile up. That rivalry starting to flare up now. Huge drive here for both teams. Minnesota looking to retake the lead after losing it on the last touchdown by Iowa but they are within field goal range and could tie it with a Danielle Thompson kick, provided they don't turn it over. Merriman, and it's picked off, but we have a flag. We have a flag with the pick, number 77. Trying to get her name on her. No, that's 27. Megan Eagley, she's going to run in for the touchdown, but we're going to check the marker. This may be coming back. Pass. Interception intercepted by Megan Eagley with the pick a six flags on the play. pending the flag. And this one's coming back, and that's why she may have run to the end zone. Minnesota knew there was an Iowa penalty, and they may have just let up. It appears to be an offsides penalty. How about that? Two big plays nullified by penalties. We had an Abby Smith kick return called back by a block in the back. And now an offside penalty takes away a pick six from Megan Eagley. And because she had to run all the way back, she may be gassed when she's on the defensive line or a linebacker for the Iowa explosion. But not a very fast player, as you saw on her run. And now she has to run all the way back, all for naught. And of course, now she's gassed. And actually, I don't know what the penalty was, but they got a fresh set of downs. So it's first and goal from the one. Merriman goes to Cersei. Can she cross the plane? No! Cersei's had a few good plays, and there are a few plays where she can't seem to find daylight. 
No gain on the play. Second and goal from the one. In the biggest position of the game thus far. Cersei in the backfield again. Four receivers for the machine. Quarterback keeper, Merriman. Touchdown, Minnesota. One yard run, Manny Merriman decides, hey, I'll just take the quarterback keeper, draw the defense away using the receivers, and it pays off Minnesota with the lead. And that blocked extra point comes into play here because if Daniel Thompson can make this, then Iowa would need a touchdown to take the lead back. Thompson, ready. And the kick, just in time. Iowa was ready to block it, but it's good. 17-13, our score with 11.28 left in the fourth. And if you are wondering how Minnesota would respond to adversity against the team they have lost to three straight times, that possession certainly says something. But once again, a penalty setting that up. In what was a 14-point swing, you had Lexi or Megan Eagley with a pick six, but it was called back because of an offsides penalty. Again, Minnesota may have seen the flag, may have seen the penalty, and they may have let up their pursuit on Eagley, but nonetheless, a 14-point swing. Had she run it back to Pater, instead of a 17-13 score, we could have had a 19 or 20 to 10 score, and Minnesota will be trailing by two possessions. Instead, they're up 17-13, and now the pendulum is back in Iowa's direction. Another onside kick attempt. A strange play call by Willie Howard. You, again, a very aggressive coach. But when you have a lead that's less than one possession, it's a very gutsy play call, especially as Jennifer Bowling has proven her medal on the running game as Jeffrey Williams is coming back from his photos for Sports Page Magazine. And every time you seem to leave to take your photo, something big always happens. Well, Mike, there's a reason about it, a reason behind it. It's called uh, explosion. <laughs> so while he gets himself situated, Iowa will start a critical fourth down possession here at the 47. A fumble recovery by Minnesota, led to this, it's a high snap. And Bowling picks it up, but she's in trouble. And she is wrapped up at the 40. Now Gelhaus brings her down. Mike, neither team is satisfied with the performance they put out so far. I've heard the Iowa coaching staff while I was on the sidelines over there. I mean, they want this victory. These guys are playing for keeps. On the other hand, you look at the way the Minnesota machine is and the way Willie Howard and his coaching staff are, they want the victory as well. So we're still in a grudge match. Iowa knows they can play the spoiler, potentially, even though they're out of the playoff picture. And Minnesota wants to control their destiny and that rivalry really boiling now in the fourth. This is like the Packers Bears all over again. The Bears, every time they play in the NFL against the Packers, it doesn't matter if there's a playoff implication online or not, they want the victory. Packers, same way. That's what we face with these two teams here tonight. Bowling looking to make up, and she gets close to the line of scrimmage with a 10-yard game, but it's going to be third and 13 for Iowa. I mentioned in the first half that watch for the intensity to pick up. Now with a 17 to 13 lead with 10 minutes left in regulation, the intensity here has definitely picked up. And just like our last home game with Nebraska penalties playing a big role, as you saw, as I did, a 14-point swing with that offsides call uh, nullifying the... 101-yard run on an interception that was called back by a senseless penalty. I know that the Iowa coaching staff and the Iowa players are not happy with that, and Minnesota, they know they've got a break. And in a way, it cancels out the touchdown call back from Abby Smith because of a block in the back. 
In the meantime, with nine and a half left in regulation, here we are with 17 to 13. Third and 14. It's a pass. And it's picked off. A huge interception by Minnesota. Who got the pick? 85, it looks like. That would be Charlie Williamson. Tough to tell from here, but nonetheless, a huge interception. And now Minnesota can start controlling the clock with 9.20 to go. I think the biggest thing for Minnesota right now is to continue to run their game plan. They need to play penalty and uh, turnover free ball. And they can just get some good, get a long sustained drive here and come out with at least seven points or eight if they, get, if they go for a two-point conversion. They can put this game out of reach. The seventh turnover of the game, but we know Minnesota's committed a few as well, so this is not over by any means, and Searcy has nowhere to go. Hit for a loss of one. And during the third quarter, the Iowa explosion uh, defensive coordinator was just all over his team, making the adjustments in game, moving players around, telling them where to go, making sure that they were in the best position to get the stops. They expect a lot of rushes from Minnesota now to kill clock. 8.43 to go. Well, there's still a lot of time left, but they're going to play it safe. We have a flag. It could be an offsides call. Tolley fumbled the pitch. She picks it up, but I think Minnesota will catch a break here. Well, one thing that has been happening as far as the penalties is that the officials have been Crank, they've been cranking down on uh, the offensive penalties because the players are lining up with their feet behind the neutral zone, but as they lean over, their helmets are inside the neutral zone, which is what's causing the penalty. And it is an offsides call against Iowa, so that carry will be nullified, and it's second and six for the machine. In this case, you have to count. You have to credit the Minnesota quarterback with the uh, snap count. The Iowa player jumped. They uh, were anticipating for when the ball should have been snapped and the changeover in the snap count is what really led to that penalty. Second and six. Merriman hands off to Tolley. Tolley with space. Oh, level. Large the 45. Now that was explosive. <laughs> oh, it's I'm sure they've heard that a few times since their nickname change. With good hits like that, they've so picked up a good hit, a good nickname. Hit. <laughs> I believe that was bowling on the hit, but not before a five-yard carry, making it third and one. And if Minnesota can convert here, that would be big as they can kill that clock. We're down to seven minutes and 45 seconds. Minnesota the machine has a four-point lead right now. Lining up in the eye again. Merriman keeps it this time. No, it was a handoff to Cersei. It's oh, a fumble we got a recovery. Fumble recovery. It was a fumble. Who got the strip? Did someone change the color scheme? That may have been bowling on the strip. I don't think so. No, they. It was a first down, forward progress. Okay. They, I, it's tough to tell from here. It's a bang bang play. We don't have a producer. On we don't the field. have. A, we don't have a monitor. We don't have a monitor. We don't have a lot of things, and it's a bang bang play. But we take stock of what we do have. Yes, and the official stopped it at forward progress, even though bowling continued on as any player would. You play until you hear the whistle. But a big first down conversion for the machine, nonetheless. And off to Tolley. Tolley wrapped up behind the line at midfield. With the tackle is Eagley. And the person who ended up coming up with the ball in that previous play was number 13 for Iowa. Lulu Kiotai. And you were talking about snap counts earlier. The fumble recovery that led to Minnesota's touchdown was led because of a perfectly timed snap as Minnesota was blitzing, which I'm sure you saw on the field. Yes. 
unfortunately, looking through a camera lens, you don't always get a chance to see things. So I knew that the, that the turnover occurred. I did not actually get a chance to see it and identify it. Four yard loss after the carry from Tolly. This time they go to Cheese. And Cheese breaks through one tackle, but will not get to the original line of She's scrimmage, gains three, but She's down to the 47. That's fine for Minnesota. They stay in bounds, but again, they like to get a few more points on the board and give themselves a cushion. And you really have to credit Minnesota's response. I thought the wheels were coming off, and I wasn't sure how they would respond to bowling making that charge, and then they come up with a big fumble recovery. Well, like I said, both teams are really fired up right now. They both want the win, and this is a win-at-all-cost type of situation. Both teams know it, and you can expect this one to go right down to the wire with five minutes and 30 seconds left in regulation. One thing on the third quarter that the Iowa coaching staff was pointing out about their own team was how slow they were to get to the line of scrimmage coming out of the huddle. And that's something they've been trying to work on this fourth quarter. Cheese. Picks up a couple more, but it will be well short of the first. And Minnesota will punt here. So as we approach the five minute mark, with Minnesota in their punt formation, this game could still still be won. It's only a four point lead right now. There's still plenty of time on the clock for Iowa to get back into contention in this one. Both teams have all three timeouts available. Thompson had a beautiful punt within the five in her last punt kick. We'll see if she can repeat that here. It's a clean snap. The punt, she shanked it. She'd love to have that one back. Well, there was a defender right in her face on that one, so she ended up getting it off in time and it had plenty of, of uh, hang time on it. Unfortunately, it just didn't have the distance. Good field position for Iowa, and Jennifer Bowling, despite playing her two-way status for most of this game, showing she still has the energy and the heart that made her an all-star last year. And the way she's played today, I haven't seen her outside of this, but I wouldn't be surprised if she gets all-star recognition again. Well, if she does get all-star recognition again, she definitely has earned it, at least for what we've seen here. This year's all-star game and championship game will be played in the Dallas area. I'm still working on bringing it up here. Bowling with the carry again, under pressure. She breaks through the first tackler, and so when she finds open space, that's when she's the most dangerous, but Minnesota keeps her game minimal. Nonetheless, expect her to be the catalyst for Iowa's offense on a huge drive here in the closing minutes of the fourth. Two yard gain on the play. And Second. Iowa taking their time in the huddle, being methodical, pointing out their assignments, cheering each other up. Well, there's plenty of time, no need for the hurry up. 61 yards for the score. Three and a half left in the regulation. Another pitch, and close to the first down is Iowa. Bowling again, 60 yard gain, excuse me. Third and two. And to say this is a big third down would be pointing out the obvious. Every third down is a big third down when these two teams are matched up. At this point of the game, I imagine it's four down territory as well. Every possession is crucial for either team right now. 245, Iowa, as you mentioned, being methodical. They have the two minute warning. They have all three timeouts. No need to hurry. Pitch, another flag. Bowling, shaking her way through defenders at the first down. And uh, I first down, depending on the results of the penalty. Holding on Iowa, so that first down will be called back and another costly penalty for the explosion. Penalty on 
and another break from Minnesota. 226. And instead of a first down, it's third and 13 for the explosion, and now the pressure's on. The fans are starting to cheer on their machine. The clock stopped at 2.26. Costly penalties have marred Iowa's chances in this game, but we'll see if they can respond. They did score 13 points unanswered before Minnesota's last touchdown. Axley had to throw to Bowling. It was a forward pass ruled incomplete, but give credit to Minnesota's defensive line for putting on the heat. This is the motivation that Coach Howard was giving his team at halftime. Fourth and 13. There's 2.11 left. You still have the two-minute warning, and Iowa has all three timeouts, so a stop here does not cement the game per se, but... So, Mike, do you put your punting formation out and hope that you can use your timeouts to get the ball back, or do you go for it and hope you can get pick up at least 13 yards? Iowa looks like they'll go for it. The whole game hinges on one play at the 2-11 mark. Axling going deep. And the pass is caught by Dickinson. A first down at the 40. A 26-yard pass and the biggest play of the night so far. We are now at the two-minute warning. 158 officially. Sign that quarter up for the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> If they hang around, there's talk, well, there's still talk about the Vikings perhaps relocating. I uh, really, as far as the Vikings relocating, I think right now that's too early. I think right now it's a lot of bluffing. you got legislators right now who are, or who are saying in a recession, we're not going to buy a new stadium, not with taxpayer funds. You've got an owner who says we want a stadium and our lease is expiring at the end of this season and our facility is still being repaired and we don't want to play there anyway. So this is the stalemate you see anytime you have budget negotiations, especially between public and private enterprises. I, it would not surprise me to see them come to an agreement at the end of the season next year, if there is a season. I think the more pressing concern in the NFL right now is the lockout. We might have the makings for another show down the road. But at least we know that right now, uh, before the NFL is supposed to come into summer camp, we've got some pretty hot football action right here with your Iowa explosion and Minnesota machine. It's 17 to 13 coming out of the two-minute warning. Two minutes left in regulation. Bowling with the pitch, and she's wrapped up behind the line of scrimmage. Gellhouse was the first to get to her, and Heather Baker finishes her off. And now the clock ticks. I would like to see what football would be played with the old rules. There used to be a rule with the forward pass that if it was an incomplete pass, it was a turnover. We'd have a lot more turnovers in this era for both the WFA and the NFL and all levels of football if that were the case. There was also a rule that the quarterback had to remain five yards behind the line of scrimmage before the pass. Second and 13. Low snap. Axling fields it cleanly. Oh, yes. Sweet catch. Chantella Steffi did not quite get on the same page and bobbles it. Big third down here, third and 13. Now, 100 years ago, that would have been a turnover. Here, it's third down. Adrenaline, high, emotions, pouring, intensity, revved up. And it's a pass, a lot of space to run. And Iowa going out of bounds, no, they do not get out of bounds. It's gonna be a first down, it appears, yes. At the 30 yard line. And now Iowa will use one of their three timeouts. I couldn't see who got the reception, but that was a huge passing play. And Iowa's conversions on third and fourth down, absolutely critical. Now we're at the 59 second mark left on the clock. 
unlike when I called it with a minute and nine at how going into the half when I said there was 59 seconds and there was really 69. Right now there is 59 seconds left in this ball game. Iowa has to score a touchdown. A field goal will not be enough. Please join the machine players and coaches. And that, of course, was set up by the blocked extra right point from Iowa's so last touchdown. So a lot of big plays one. all coming to fruition here. Of course, we'll be back here this time next week for their final ball. regular season game against the Wisconsin Wolves. And depending on how this plays out, could be a big game. It could be a nice tune-up game. It, it's going to be a fun game regardless, but... Uh, it all hinges on these final 59 seconds. Well, like I said at the beginning of the broadcast today, Iowa and Minnesota always keep it close. Axley going for the dagger. Complete. Touchdown, Iowa. No flags. It's Dickinson, Ashley Dickinson, with a 30-yard touchdown catch. What a play. Now it's going to... That gives it. Minnesota time, though. Well, that gives Minnesota time, but now it's a two-point game. Do they come out for the extra point, or do they try a two-point conversion? Extra point, Minnesota still has a chance to tie. If they... Um, they're going for the extra point. They are going the, if they If they're going to go for the two-point conversion, then Minnesota, if they were successful, Minnesota would have to score a touchdown in the last 50 seconds in order to win. But right now, it is a... 20-17 Iowa lead as we have 50 seconds remaining in regulation. Daniel, or Jennifer Bowling with the extra point. 50 seconds left. Minnesota has all three timeouts. What does Willie Howard tell his team? We haven't seen a two-minute drill all season. Here I don't know what Willie tells his team. We haven't seen a two-minute drill all season, but now... We need to do a one-minute drill. I know that that's what's in his mind. We need to do a one-minute drill right now. And I have no idea you know, how well this team is going to be. I, I think a lot of that's going to have to de de depend on how the kickoff goes. All Minnesota needs is a field goal to tie, which means effectively they would have to get with inside the red zone to be in... Thompson's effective range to tie it up. Her career long is 37. She missed a field goal from that range earlier this season. And if you're Iowa, do you squib kick? Do you go for a deep kick? They've tried a few short kicks earlier. If I were the Iowa coach, I would go long. But I'm not the Iowa coach. So. Neither am I. But we've seen some interesting play calls from Iowa's end as well. They are going they are deep. Going deep. <laughs> Smith fields it cleanly. This return is big. She's still, still on her feet. feet. Trying and to cut out. Good blocking. Pass midfield. Looking for space. It's a big return, but because she cut back, that took 19 seconds off the clock. She gets to the 35, but 19 seconds were eaten up in that return. Still a big one, but only 31 seconds left. Minnesota, if they have anything left, it has to come now. Now remember, now with that run back, all they have to do is get 15 effective yards or more within the next 28 seconds in order to leave room for Danielle Thompson to come up with a tie. And you have a quarterback who doesn't have a lot of experience at this position. You have a running core who's been effective, but... And you still have one timeout left. Still have timeouts, of course, too. But they've shown some signs of... Fatigue late. Merriman going for the throw. Incomplete. Incomplete. No flag. 27 seconds. Second and 10. What a time for someone to call you. Maybe they want to know the score. I think he, I think he probably does, but no. I'm on a broadcast. I can't tell him the score right now. You'd have to listen. <laughs> or he should have been here at 7. We need a radio broadcast team. Maybe do a live access model. The WNBA has it. But that's not important right now. Second and 10, 27 seconds. It's a pitch to Cersei. And 
and Cersei not going to go far. She does run out of bounds, but she won't gain much. 19 seconds, third and nine. The running game slowing down after the first quarter and the throw not working all that well either. Minnesota will take a timeout to discuss things. And it's a guess as to what play they'll draw up for third and nine. Right now the offense is gathered around. Whatever happens, this will go down in the history of this rivalry. Again, Iowa has won the last three games, including the playoff game last year. So what do you think is going to happen? Your guess is as good as mine. As you pointed out in the Nebraska game, in the words of Vince Lombardi, any play has the opportunity to break for a big play. That was actually Bud Grant's philosophy. Grant. Well, Bud Grant learned that from Vince Lombardi. Um, Lombardi believed that every play could be designed to go the distance, and a young Bud Grant picked up on that, and when you had the Purple People Eaters in the 1970s that went to four Super Bowls, that was the entire philosophy of that team. And I think that's the same type of philosophy that they've got to have here if the Minnesota machine is going to be in contention to withstand the late surge by the Iowa explosion. that chant often. Danielle Thompson is warming up. She knows that this game may be on the line. Minnesota needs effectively 14 more yards though for her to be a legitimate threat. And here we go, 19 seconds left. It's Smith on a reverse. Smith going, still moving. And she's wrapped up at the 27. 10 seconds left on the clock. Minnesota will take its second timeout. Fourth and two. You're at the 27. That's still outside Thompson's range. I believe they have one timeout left. You have to go for it here. If Iowa hangs on, though, the game changer was their big third and fourth down conversions on their last drive. Two minutes and 11 seconds left in, regu in regulation. And that 30-yard touchdown pass to Ashley Dickinson may make her the hero. That was incredible. In the Hawkeye State. Not quite a recreation of Antonio Freeman's Monday night catch that left Al Michaels a gasp, but very close. The game will be decided on this play, barring a defensive penalty. It's a run! Smith! It's got to break free. She's got to get to the first down and get out of bounds. And she, she gets does. The first she gets the first down. Three seconds remaining in regulation. That's still outside Thompson's range, though, so Minnesota will have to go to the air. And a quarterback. Well, no. I think, Maybe not. I think Howard has trust in his uh, kicking game. And he figures right now three seconds left. We need a field goal to tie. Let's give it a shot. Thompson lining up for the field goal attempt. This would be a 40-yard field goal and a career long if Thompson can nail it. And there's a timeout. Minnesota had one left. What perfect opportunity to use it. What a seconds from now, you'll have just had one extra timeout that you don't need anymore. Exactly. Now, if we have overtime, I can't quite tell you what would happen yet because they do follow NFL rules, but I'm not sure if they go with the collegiate overtime rules or the professional overtime rules. We'll find out. So we'll learn just as you will if we get to that situation. And again, though, just a great chapter to this rivalry regardless, and you have to give credit to Iowa no matter what the outcome is for fighting and fighting despite having a shorthanded roster, getting clobbered by the Kansas City Tribe who knocked them out of the playoff run and coming in here to play the spoiler role. 
Iowa has just done an amazing job tonight. They, they were down early. They crept right back into this game. They took the lead. They came behind, took the lead again. And now it's all in the foot of Danielle Thompson. This will be a classic game, however it goes down. 40-yard field goal try. Kick is up, and that's going to be short. And it's about short. three yards short. Well, Thompson, not quite her range yet. She'll get there, but Iowa comes away with a 20 to 17 win. Their fourth consecutive victory over the Minnesota machine, going back to their Thunder days. I really don't think that uh, Howard had anything to, anything to lose on that. If you would have had a put your regular lineup in, you would have needed the, the touchdown. And in th you know, what, three seconds left, incomplete pass, falling short, that would have that had the same result. You at least put your kicker out there, try to get them the opportunity to finish strong, and the kick was tried and true. The spot was good, the follow through was good, the range was just a little bit short. Fun game regardless, and we know this much now. Next game will be relevant regardless of the outcome for the Wisconsin Wolves. So come back here next week. We're going to have a huge playoff fight just like last year. Final score, 20 to 17. I will head down to the field to get some post-game interviews to wrap up this broadcast. And next game is next Saturday, the 18th. At 7. At 7 o'clock, Einer Anderson Stadium on the campus of Minnetonka High School, Minnetonka, Minnesota. Be here. I will go down to the field now. Mike Peden here with Courtney Axling, player of the game for the Iowa Explosion. Courtney, describe that fourth quarter pass to Ashley Dickinson. You know, um, when she came into the huddle, she just said, hey, I'm, I'm open, you know, just hit me. And so I just took the snap and, and waited a couple seconds and, and saw her open and I just let it go. And, you know, the rest, uh, she did the rest. So it was awesome. How did this game symbolize your fight through adversity? You had dealt with ownership changes. You had to answer a 10 point deficit and then you had to answer another deficit in this game to fight for the win. You know, we, we have. We've we've gone through a lot and you know, with injuries, with um, ownership change and everything and you know, we've all stuck together through through everything and, and that's what that's what makes us a team and the coaches have stuck by us and, and we're just a, a tight knit group and it just gets us through everything. Uh, you're not in the playoff picture, unfortunately, this year with their division realignment, but what do you look to accomplish for the last game of the season next week? We just want to come out with a win. You know, we, um, we've we gone through a lot this season and um, and over overcame a lot of things, and so we just want to come out with a win. Our last game's at home, and so we just want to want to come out on, on top. So Now, throughout this game, you started favoring the pass, especially in the second half after using bowling a lot in the first half. Was that your game plan going in? Um, you know, it, we didn't know really going into it. We just wanted to see how Minnesota was going to play. Um, and then we just started passing, and they were they were uh, being a little more honest with that. And, and, and we just we just took that and, and ran with it. So. And then just give me the reaction you and Dickinson had after that game-winning touchdown. Oh man, I, I was so excited. I, I was like, oh, just get in the get in the end zone, and you know, there's not any words that can describe it. I was just really excited. So, well, how can you describe this rivalry? It's been very close the last four games. You've won the last four against Minnesota, but it doesn't play out that way. <laughs> no, it hasn't been pretty. You know, um, I'm surprised it didn't rain tonight. Usually it <laughs> rains when we play Minnesota, um, but no, they are a tough team, and every time we, we come in to play them, it's um, it's a battle, and it's you know it comes down to the last second on every game. So, anyone you want to say hi to that might be watching? Um, hi to my family, and uh, and thanks to the coaches. You know they've done a great job. So. Well, thanks again, and like you said, thanks for the rain for holding off and giving exactly. us another great chapter exactly. in this border rivalry. Exactly. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Go celebrate the win. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was Courtney Axling, Iowa's player of the game. We'll have a chat with Minnesota shortly. Uh, they came out and made more plays. Um, it, it stinks. It's not the way that we wanted to finish the game, obviously, and go into the playoffs and give ourselves an opportunity to be in the playoffs. But you know what? We got a, a game next week. We got the Wolves that we got to take on here. So we just got to go to practice and, and fix some of our mistakes and see what we can do next week. It was close, and that would have tied it. And it's a tough way to lose. And it took us. Um, it took the whole team to get us to that point, and it was up to me to try and tie it, but can't get them all, I guess. She made three in practice from that distance, but also that's when her 
when she wasn't running, playing defensive back, uh, playing wide receiver, and so she's a little bit tired. Uh, put ourselves in a position either it's going to be a Hail Mary or it's going to be a kick. So we had to figure out which one we we're going to do, and that's what we chose. Mike Peden here with Yolanda Searcy, who had a six-yard touchdown run earlier today for Minnesota. Wasn't enough for the win, but describe this rivalry with Iowa. Um, and this is, uh, what, three, four years now going on head-to-head, -head and usually we come out 1-1 one, one tie or 2-1 this year. We done fell twice, so it's okay, though. Um, it's just hard fought. It's a great rivalry. We all come in, we fight hard. You know, we get along on the field, off the field. It's just, it's like a family. I mean, Iowa and Minnesota are like a family, even though we're different and, you know, we're opponents, but we still play as a family, even though, you know, it's the opposite. But, you know, it's, it's hard and it hurts, but, you know, we get over it. Well, Iowa's won the last four games against you, including the playoff game last year, but the way you two play, it never feels like one team has the upper hand. Yeah, no, it's, it's an evenly match, and it always depends on who's going to make that last mistake, and they go capitalize. Uh, this game had just when we made that last mistake, and they capitalized on it, but we'll get them next time. Describe the final minute. You know, Iowa had the touchdown. You go for a field goal to try to tie the game up. Was that the plan? Um, the initial plan was to try to run the kickoff back, but then we didn't. We got as far as we could, and, you know, we, we was pushing the ball, and then depending on our kicker, and, you know, she's usually around that 20, 25, 35-yard line, we can get her in, but she, uh, it wasn't, we didn't get there as quite as well. We gave her our best shot, and she did what she could, and we fell a couple of yards short. And what does this rivalry mean for the league and for the Midwest, even though you two are no longer in the same division? Oh, um, man, it means a lot. I mean, it just got to let you know. You know, we may fall to some of the bigger teams hard, but then you got to see, you know, they come in with 70, 80 players, and we're coming with 20 to 40, and we're smaller, but we're fighting just as hard. And, if, you know, any given day, you know, we can beat one of the Michigans or the Kansas Cities, and just fighting with Iowa just describes how hard we do work to play against each other and how hard we do sacrifice our bodies. And any given day, we can make that move and win versus anybody. Now you have some fight left because now you're going to have to play and beat Wisconsin to claim the division title and a playoff spot. So how do you regroup and focus for what's going to be an all-out battle next week? We leave this game on the field and we focus for next week. We start off tomorrow with a fresh new day. We just get in our playbooks, focus, heal, ice, sleep, rest, and just get on the field and do what we need to do, come to play. That's the veteran strategy. And there's anyone you want to say hi to that might be watching this? I just want to say hi to my family and my wife and my teammates and coaches. Good work, ladies. Well, we'll see you next week. And like you said, new day, new game. This game is in the past. Absolutely. Thanks for speaking with us, and we'll see you next Sunday. It's going to be fun regardless. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yolanda Searcy of the Minnesota Machine. Iowa wins 20-17, to but a well-fought game, a great addition to this Iowa-Minnesota rivalry. For everyone here at TSB Television, I'm Mike Peden. Thank you for watching. Tune in next week.